session. I'm Leslie the Third. I'm Jack Allison. I'm Shannon. And today we're doing a very special episode. We recently just did a poll of who's everyone's favorite guest. And I got to say, this man is currently, currently leading the field. You know, you have Aubrey out there. You have Shannon Strucci out there. But, <laughs> you know, possibly, possibly this guy is going to uh, take it away. And that's, of course, Will Menneker of Chapo Trap House. Thank you so much for coming back. Uh, it's a joy and a pleasure. Um, and thank you so much for, you know, uh, hosting me on the show and really giving a platform for my research. I have spent uh, every waking <laughs> moment of the last two weeks documenting every line of dialogue spoken by a woman in one of Quentin Tarantino's movies. <laughs> <laughs> um, excluding, of course, Jackie Brown and Kill Bill, which I, um, I, I didn't, I didn't include those, don't those count in my for research. Some reason. Those don't count. I didn't include that in my research or any of the graphs that I created, but I'm just happy to, you know, go through all my spreadsheets with you guys. Um, every single second of dialogue is accounted for. Well, in Death Proof, it's not even a movie, right? No, it was. So well, why would you count it? No, yeah. no, that was part of a, a double movie, so no, <laughs> it doesn't count. And today, of course, we're talking some Tarantino. Finally, we've we've you know been nibbling around the edges of this because because the discourse has already been going on for at least a year around this film. It was all bad. <laughs> it was all bad leading up to it. There I, hasn't it was, been a moment of good discourse around this movie, even 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 in the aftermath. I don't think it's been very good. But we're here to give you some good stuff, folks, and we're here to tell you. First of all, if you have not seen the film, we don't don't normally do this. Prop, maybe don't listen to the episode because, sure. you know, there is a big kind of spoiler that we're going to be talking about uh, with this film that I think if you know going into the film, you may not enjoy it quite as much. Not quite as much. So I would say, you know, pause for the calls, go out and watch it. And I will say go out and watch it because it's a fantastic fucking movie. It fucking rules. I loved it so much. I went to see it twice. Um, yep. Just first, everyone's first impressions. I just, but I'll, I'll just say like, I really, really love this film. I mean, yeah, I really like the movie, too. And it's, it's one of these things where, like, if you want to pull it apart and kind of, like, look at every scene, you're like, this is kind of a movie that, like, meanders and is, like, maybe a little bit over long. But it's one of those things where it's, like, if it's over long and it meanders, but every single moment where it's meandering and over long is, like, fucking great and just, like, very compelling. It's, like, it, it's just, it, I, I don't know. I can't deny that. I'm, like, this was... uh uh this, you know, uh, this movie was never boring for a moment. And I think Tarantino really knows how to make fucking movies. Yeah, no, this was um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is the first movie I have I made a conscious effort. I, I saw it in the theater twice. This is the first movie I've done that with since Fury Road. And like that, like that's, wow. the, that's what I can compare it to, like in a movie where like from the first frame to the last, I just had like a huge grin on my face and like just left the theater just overjoyed and just sort of imbued with, with movie magic. Uh, that, that's really how it made me feel. Um, I liked it a lot. I liked it more than I thought I would, even as like a Tarantino fan. Um, going into it, I had this image in my mind. I had been to the Museum of Death in New Orleans and they have like the photos of the Sharon Tate murders there. And I was like, what is this going to be like watching this in this kind of like goofy movie um, and all the stuff that happened with Uma Thurman. And I did have some issues with it, but overall, I really enjoyed it. And I wish I'd had a better audience because I went with me uh, with my little brother and we were the only people laughing in the entire theater. Oh, that's so sad. And it was the hear. most alienating experience because it was a really funny movie. I can I would oh, say yeah. it's Tarantino's funniest movie, hands down. Yes. And uh, the, the, yeah. both of the audiences that I saw the movie with uh, were just like, you know, gales of laughter, uh, especially... <laughs> In the at the very end of the movie, <laughs> yeah, a woman turned around and looked at me because I was laughing. What towards the beginning of the That's movie, like and I just look back at her like, okay, <laughs> it was really weird. <laughs> very well, weird. I think Shannon, you may have accidentally gone to a screening that included all the remaining members of the Manson cult. <laughs> That's the <laughs> only way I can make sense of that. Maybe. But yeah, this movie was hilarious. Uh, now, I remember when this movie was announced and that Tarantino was going to make uh, some Manson shit, going to make a Manson sure. film. And I think when we all heard that, we kind of had a sp very specific image, like you mentioned, uh, Shannon, of mm -hmm. what we were going to see <laughs> in this film. Something, you know, truly gut-wrenching and awful and haunting, yeah. and that was going to fuck us up for years. But he actually did kind of the exact 
opposite no, it, of that. It's yeah. kind of like a sweet movie. Actually. Yes, delightful. Yeah, delightful. It really yeah. is. The, the, the ending of the movie was uh, was joyous to me. And yeah. you know, this is where you should probably uh, you know switch off because honestly, if you haven't seen this movie, you will enjoy it a lot more not knowing this element of it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like you guys, I was going into this movie just thinking like, oh, oh God, like we, we're going to have to spend the last 20 minutes of this movie watching, you know, uh, like an eight months pregnant Sharon Tate get butchered uh, by the Manson <laughs> family. Like, oh God, what is Tarantino going to do with this? And yeah. go, and honestly, we I should have seen it coming after Inglorious Bastards, what he yeah. did in that movie, <laughs> where it's like you spend the, all of that movie just being like, okay, like how is he going to get out of this box of like, we know Hitler and <laughs> Goebbels are just going to get away. And then Eli Roth just busts in uh, the, you know, the movie theater and just unloads three clips into both of their faces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he did it with that. And it, like with, with this movie too, where it's like, you know, the, every time you see Margot Robbie on screen, just like, uh, you know, just imbued with such life and joy, you're just yeah. you're, you're dreading uh, the inevitability of that. But no, he throws that completely out of the window and subverts your expectations. Where he's like, "Now, wh what if I were to tell you you will see two women get brutally murdered at the end of this movie, <laughs> but you will be laughing and cheering hysterically the entire right. time?" Yeah, this isn't. It's an interesting movie. It, it it's like. It's, 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 it, what you said, uh, Will, is that it was like, a, it's like a very joyous and kind of like that, you know, people always talk about like, you know, the, the, a film that makes them feel like the magic of movie making again or something. And I think this movie actually like does that. This movie is a love letter to cinema in a way that, you know, the artist really is not or a lot of these other <laughs> movies about movies really are well, not. I mean, that is like, uh, like, you know, what come time for Oscar season will be QT be taking home, uh, the statue <laughs> once again. Uh, who knows? But I mean, like, you're right that like, uh, Hollywood loves movies and the Oscars especially do, uh, uh, will like they shell out Oscars all the time for movies that are about like the magic of movies. Like, yeah. uh, when I saw, uh, the shape of water and that scene where the fish man just goes into the movie theater and is like, you know, <laughs> wondrously like, you know, <laughs> staring at the colors right. and the images on the screen. I was like, yeah. they're probably going to give this one piece of, the... of shit best picture. Yeah. And lo and behold, they did. And I really feel yeah. like, Tarantino is really the only director that can like self-consciously make movies that are just about how much he loves movies and not have yeah. it be intensely obnoxious. I don't know how he fucking does it. Yeah. yeah. You know, I actually even I will say that and I don't think it does ruin it. I did anticipate a little bit the sort of alt history ending after Inglorious Bastards. And I don't think it like ruined the movie for me at all. And it still did surprise me when it finally went that way at the end. I still think, though, that it's like. You know, there, like I said, there's something kind of like joyous and like sweet about the movie almost. It's like, it's like if Hollywood was applied in a real way to the Sharon Tate story. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like if Hollywood as a story structure was applied to that real life event. Yeah. Cause, uh, you know, the story, the thing about the Manson family, how, what everybody talks about, what they meant to America and this country is that it was kind of like this end of this, you know, age of, you know, hippies and free love and it showed like the dark half of it. And that also was around the time where like what Tarantino noticed was that like where old Hollywood was going away and new Hollywood was starting. There's lots, there's tons of tons of references to both things, the old Western movies and TV shows and right. these old cowboys getting older. But then wow. there's like the new kids coming out like at, at one point um i think uh leonardo dicaprio's character calls someone uh dennis hopper as like an insult he calls tex watson uh get, he's like get the fuck out of my driveway dennis hopper <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> and so like thematically it kind of felt like showing because but at the but also like it's not just like the mansons are new hollywood it's more like because they attack you know sharon tate and roman polanski are part of it so it kind of felt like old Hollywood proving that they still had something of value by saving new Hollywood. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and like, uh, like another big part of the movie, like a, like a, a sort of like an arc in, in, in DiCaprio, the Rick Dalton's character, Rick Dalton character is this like dilemma about like, he's 
sort of stalled out, like he had a successful TV series and not very good movie career. And now he's sort of stalled out playing uh, the heavy on like network sitcoms and stuff. Right. And the Al Pacino character like presents him in the very first scene of the movie. Like, do you want to keep doing that? Or do you want to go to Rome and make spaghetti Westerns with Sergio Corbucci? And like his decision to, um, you know, go out of his comfort zone and, you know, go to Europe and, and make spaghetti Westerns and like, which were, you know, the more uh, like self-consciously like ironic and kind of, uh, you know, the anti-heroic uh, as opposed to like the traditional American cowboy and like make that transition from old to new was like a, you know, a, a really like the, like a, like the hinge of the movie. Yeah. And what I liked about that scene is that it was su- that speech about how, you know, um, they're bringing you in to go all come on these TV shows and you get your ass kicked at the end of the show. And then like they're, what they're doing is they're devaluing uh, you as a performer mm-hmm. in order to elevate the new guys. And I was just like, oh, that's just exactly how pro wrestling works and how like that, <laughs> that's exactly uh, how, you know, older wrestlers are treated. And I guess Hollywood kind of has the same thing going on, which I do want to note all the people who were making fun of uh, Vin Diesel, The Rock and um, uh, Jason Statham for putting it in their contracts that they can't get uh beat up too much you are wrong you are being anti-worker what they're trying to do is protect <laughs> their gimmick they're trying to protect their character because nobody else gives a fuck about them and all these hollywood <laughs> producers would chew them up and spit them out if they could i think the other thing that's like, like that's going on with the, uh, with this movie like especially like you know the 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 ending uh, of the movie and this alt history that he portrays and like you know spoiler alert uh what you know what happens is that the uh the, you know the Manson murderers instead of walking up uh Sharon Tate's driveway decide to take out their rage on TV cowboy Rick Dalton for uh, <laughs> confronting them in the driveway they bust for in the wonderful at tequila yeah 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 and then they bust in on Brad Pitt uh, who's on acid and his <laughs> dog and it just does not go well for them. <laughs> um, so like, you know, Tarantino, like basically from his first movie to this most recent one, he really only makes like his only real abiding interest is movies. Like that's the only thing his movies are really about. And like, right. it, and like, you know, you could say it's like shallow on a certain level, but I said like, he really does pull it off and like Inglorious Bastards, where he throws history out the window and he's like, what if, you know, this team of like, you know, guerrilla insurgent Jewish soldiers, what if they actually like assassinated the entire Nazi high command, like before the final solution was fully like, you know, ramped up and like carried out? So he's like, and in that movie with the the Shoshana character and the Fazbender was like a film critic before he joined the OSS or whatever. He's <laughs> like, that whole movie is about how like, uh, every aspect of like film production uh, and our film artistry comes together to stop the Holocaust. And in this movie, he like he he really does the same thing. But what I what I found joyous about that is what he's really saying is that like once something is put on film and once something becomes a movie, it it doesn't really matter whether it actually happened or not. When you're talking about history, like if something is on film, it's as real as anything else in the past is to like, especially to an American audience. Cause that's largely how we learn about and understand the past is through movies. Yeah. So what he's saying is that like, what I found so hopeful about the end of the movie is that he's really showing you that like through art and movies specifically, we can create for ourselves like a better, more hopeful reality. One in which, you know, the Manson murders never happened and, you know, American culture never took that like, you know, dark turn. I mean, it's like overly simplified, but like, yeah, like you, you were saying, Leslie, people really peg like the Manson murders at the end of 1969 as being like, you know, the epochal turn in American culture from like the good vibes of the 60s to like the bad vibes of everything that came after that. And also like uh, another huge part of the movie is all of the, the car radio stuff it was like really one of my favorite parts about the movie. And one of the first things you hear on the radio outside of the, the music itself is something about Sirhan Sirhan uh, being convicted for assassinating RFK and uh, like a thousand dead communists in Vietnam. Yeah. So it's like, it's not so simple that he's just like, he's saying like all that darkness and violence was like already there, but like, I guess people finally noticed it, uh, you know, when this, you know, beautiful actress was murdered by these crazy hippies. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, like, like what you were just laying out, um, his, you know, kind of theme about, you know, putting it on film, kind of making it and changing reality. That's the same, um, thesis of, uh, Philip K. Dick's, um, uh, The Man in the High Castle, which I recommend everybody should read the book. Don't watch the interminable soap opera on Amazon, but the book is very good. And, and, you know, that idea of like, you know, changing or, the past or at least getting revenge for it that's kind of a through line through the you know the past several uh tarantino films specifically and i'm really disappointed in on like the woke um liberal writers of like slate and whatever have not picked up on this the past four quentin tarantino films have been about getting revenge on white supremacists right like you had django right. you had inglorious bastards mm-hmm. you had hateful eight and now you have the madsen uh family i'm just like how like people this- forget that manson was a nazi too. yeah people <laughs> right. really uh, right. forget I, that is actually a little it's like actually unfair to hippies that people associate manson so much with it's actually it's like it's very much like the current day alt-right and fight club it's just the aesthetic it has not like you know charles manson's entire thing was about like inciting a race riot he like really wasn't like a hippie in the traditional sense he just hung out with some of the beach boys and dressed like a hippie yeah the one guy that we think Charles Manson might have killed himself was like a black drug dealer. Like they, we think he, uh, that if you dive into true crime, you might, you'll, uh, learn, uh, that he might have murdered a black drug dealer before all the other murders took place, but they were like a white, uh, supremacist, uh, cult. Right. And I, what I really liked about the film and the, especially the ending, it just showed, made them look so fucking small. And ridiculous and absurd. Yeah, like true. this is what should have happened to them. They should have gotten the shit beat out of them. But you know, they're just, a, they're not, you know, say these crazy, spooky witches. Right. They're sadists. like clowns. They're like kids. <laughs> yeah. They're fucking losers. And as soon, and you know, when they're not picking on like film nerds and pregnant women, <laughs> they will get their shit fucking wrecked. And that's what, like, I just love when he says, I'm here to do Satan's work, like that famous line that you know everybody who follows true crime knows and brad pitt just fucking laughs at him (laughs) that it's so like that just felt so good and i didn't i didn't expect to feel just so happy i felt like i was fucking floating when because you know the because i really did feel the tension all the way to the end like oh wait i'm gonna watch sharon tate get murdered right and then it shifted to oh wait i'm gonna watch these two guys who i've fallen in love with during this film get brutally murdered by this cult right and then i watched sharon tate get murdered and i was like fuck quinnon don't do it to me and he did not (laughs) fucking do it to me thank you my woke king quinnon tarantino for you yeah. know giving those fucking dirty racist hippies not all hippies yeah. are racist, but those hippies fucking them up Thank yeah you. Uh, my, my fear was that he, they were gonna kill sharon tate and everybody else then it was gonna be like a, a violent revenge thing i figured it wasn't gonna be historically accurate and i was like oh this is just still gonna be really unpleasant and then it was just slapstick which i really love slapstick violence so like I said, I, my brother and I were laughing a whole lot, and everyone else was pretty quiet. Even though it was, like I said, it was very alienating um, because even though it's so graphically violent, it's still funny. You know, and I get why people have had problems with it, but it's still really funny. Yeah. Oh, it was hysteric. I mean, come on the the Chekhov's flamethrower that he sets up <laughs> in that movie, which is like in the very beginning, he gives you the right. the scene from the Fourteen Fists of McCluskey. <laughs> Where, you right. know, they do, I, I really appreciated that he, they did the actual, like, stuntman flame thing where they, those guys were yep. actually on yep. fire, yeah. like John yes. Carpenter mm-hmm. did yeah. in that long They got a bunch the, of guys to, like, thing. spin around in circles. Yeah, with, like, 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 like <laughs> nine guys <laughs> on, completely on fire, which is, like, no, sm- like, again, to create just a throwaway joke in, like, the very, yeah. like, as part, like a, a remember, as part of, like, a conversation <laughs> in, like, the very beginning of the movie. But then he gives you, like, what I thought was, like, one of the funniest gags in the movie is... Is when uh, Rick Dalton, DiCaprio's character, is bragging about, he's like, oh yeah, he's like, I practice on that bad boy, like that dragon, you do not want to be on the business end of that. And it cuts to him and he's like, oh fuck. And he's like, can we do anything about
about this heat? And he goes, Rick, it's <laughs> a flamethrower. So funny. Can we do and then when, and then the when, uh, when Pitt goes back to his house to fix his antenna and goes in his like tool shed, you see the flamethrower there and you're like, oh, wow. Oh, it's the flamethrower from earlier. Yeah. And then he pays it off at the end in the absolute wow. funniest way possible. Yeah. And Sharon, to your point, I mean, Shannon, I'm sorry, to your point about um, at the end, like the, the slapstick nature of the violence, like, it's super nasty too. Like when he slams that woman's head into uh, like the yeah. phone and the desk. Oh, it was like kind of stomach turning, but you can't help but laugh. And I think people, when they talked about like, um, there was like the, it was like, you know, uh, like, you know, uh, the, the violence against women in Tarantino movies is, you know, often played for laughs. And like, that's disturbing. And I was just thinking like, well, the violence against everyone in his movies is pretty much always played for right. laughs. Like, and right. I think that's like missing like a, like a big influence on like his violence and like that slap sex sensibility, I really think is like, is like Looney Tunes. Like, yeah, like that, I was like, going to say it's very Tom and Jerry. It's like a very Tom and Jerry kind of violence. I felt like one of my favorite things about Hateful Eight, I mean, I haven't seen it since it came out. Was that I forget the character, the actress, but like one of them would like punch her in the face and the audience would kind of laugh, but then he would linger on it and it kind of indicted the audience for laughing. Like, I think he's smart enough to understand the implications of like serious yeah. violence against women on screen or like realistic violence against women. But I mean, the whole, the whole, for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the whole film is so serious and just leading up to the like funniest, like most brutal slapstick <laughs> violence I've seen in a long time. Which, like y'all were talking about, kind of takes the power away from this group. Um, because if you just showed them as like really scary badasses who they had to fight, that's just giving their memory and whatever they did more power. Again, and and it is almost like you know we're anticipating for this entire movie to watch violence in in a way that is like almost as gruesome as this. Like we're gearing up and stealing ourselves to watch violence as gruesome as this, and then he does that violence, but then it's like in such a way and against characters that like makes it you know funny or whatever and you know to all these people that are you know that are very upset about uh, uh the violence against women in his movies it's like we didn't watch pregnant sharon tate get stabbed you know what i mean like is everybody being like you know why why didn't we just see like sharon tate get stabbed in this film <laughs> And uh, Leslie, to your point about like uh, like the 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 slate writers, I think it, I think it was in Slate, but like in that article, someone juxtaposes like you know uh, like uh, you know in Kill Bill when um, Daryl like when Daryl Hannah gets her other eye snatched out, or like you know all, all, all the all the crazy violence you know that's done to his women characters, and then they're like you know if you compare that to the scene in Hateful Eight where Samuel L. Jackson gets his balls blown off. You're like, you really, like, you're, you're supposed to, like, identify with him. And I'm like, no, that scene was really funny, too. Yeah, he said, oh, my, he said, literally, he's like, oh, my, oh, my balls. <laughs> Ow, my balls, yeah. <laughs> he's like, yep, yeah, you shot my balls off. Oh, fuck. Like, and that was payback for him being a rapist. Like, even though he yeah, was the yeah. protagonist right. character, like, Quentin Tarantino said, you know, we still got to balance the skills on this, so you get your dick blowing off. There is a very sort of, <laughs> weird uh, like morality that is this kind of like i'm saying like tom and jerry morality where it's like if it's you know it's very wily e. coyote tom and For jerry where it's spy. like the bad guy yeah the bad like villain you can hurt them as much as possible because we've like seen how bad they are uh, like another thing to your point about like not glamorizing the uh, the Manson family. Another thing I, I really appreciated in the movie is that Charles Manson is only in one scene, and it's like yeah. he's a total afterthought. Like he's almost not a character at all. Like he's right. referred to like when they when the scene where they're at the Spawn Ranch, but there's only one scene with with uh, with Charles Manson, and I remember being like. I was really excited to see the guy who played uh, Dewey Crow and Justified play Charles Manson because he has that same <laughs> yeah. like sort of little guy squirrely energy. But I thought it was it was perfect that he was just like he was in one scene. He wasn't set up to be like scary or menacing or like anything. Yeah. Like it was just sort of like a real throwaway moment where it was just sort of like a like a Hitchcock like cameo where he just sort of like yeah. he comes in and then goes out and like you, you never really see him again. I mean, we're, we're, we watched a Quentin Tarantino movie that had, uh, uh, that had Charles Manson in it that didn't have like a thousand hard R N words in it. Like this man <laughs> is growing. Like that is like growth. That is the such restraint growth. that he showed. I know. That is, is such restraint. And, and about the afterthought thing, it is, it's, it's an afterthought because he's barely shown in the film. It's also an afterthought with the casting because 
the same guy plays Charles Manson in Mind Hunter. Like he, like that's how little like he gave, you know, to Charles Manson. He didn't even try to come up with, the, you know, this unique character actor for him. He was like, oh, we'll get the guy who plays him on the fucking Netflix show, and that's it. There were there was at least one other uh, Madison Beatty who had played the same Manson family member on a different show or movie or something. Yeah, I think a, he did a couple Aquarius, of those. Aqua- You're just like, yeah, that so works. Funny. <laughs> And, and you know, there is uh, like a lot of the characters and you might not know this while watching, you know, the film, like a lot of the characters are just playing act real life actors like Timothy Oliphant's character is, is it playing James Stacy. Lancer was a real TV show that that was act that actually yeah. st- like a, a real thing that actually was, it had like 55 uh, episodes. Uh, like I was actually really confused about what the fuck the plot of Lancer was. <laughs> <laughs> like even like watching it twice, it still didn't make much sense. So I'll I'll just explain if you're kind of confused. So Timothy Oliphant's character and Luke Perry's character are actually brothers. They're both the sons of Big Lancer, but they're both you know weren't raised by Lancer because Lancer like impregnated two women and then had nothing to do with him and then fucked off to this ranch where he made himself really rich. Then he come, then he sends you know letters to both his sons to come. The two sons have never met each other, and then they come back and he says, "All right, I'll give you a third of this land if you prove that you're tough enough uh, to hold it." So that's what the plot of it is uh, of the show. <laughs> is uh not only that but the uh the the scene uh the, his fbi episode oh yeah. yeah where the scene where uh like they go back to his house and watch uh fbi which is just a, just a, a great like moment of like friendship well, that, dudes being pretty so just that, yeah, yeah dudes just guys be, guys dudes being rock. dudes you can get a sixer <laughs> order a pizza watch fbi being on supportive yeah. being supportive of your friend who's on tv that <laughs> scene i love that scene so not only did they cut in uh leonardo dicaprio into the great escape in that yeah. little like yes. Steve mcqueen sequence like which was fun, which was so great funny. actually and like the attention to detail there is really good but that scene from fbi is a real cold open from an old episode of fbi no, and they, they and went they, and added Leo too. They, they added Leo, but the character that the, he replaces, like the character he's playing, was played by Burt Reynolds yeah. in that FBI episode. And like much oh. of the movie, like the Dalton Booth characters are loosely based on Burt Reynolds and his stuntman, who like lived together and were like good friends of that oh, same era it. in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah Burt was supposed so. This is to like, play- what if Burt Reynolds and his and his like <laughs> stuntman killed the Manson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah Burt. Reynolds was cast to play um, Spawn, um, the guy who owns the ranch in the film, but unfortunately he, he passed away oh, uh, really? before um, they could yeah. uh, shoot it. That sucks. But I, I did, did find one really funny story about Burt Reynolds that Quentin Tarantino is enjoying play, uh, telling people. So Brad Pitt does not like people talking about how good looking he is. So that line about uh, where uh, Bruce Lee tells him, you're pretty look, you're pretty, uh, you're, you know, you're very pretty for a stunt man. That was a line that Burt Reynolds said Quentin had to put in the script and Brad Pitt does not like it. So when he uh, kind of grits his teeth while hearing it, that's actually uh real <laughs> mm. <laughs> well uh, you brought it up but like the um the the, the brad pitt uh, the cliff booth bruce lee showdown yes. was a, another feature of the kind of i don't know criticism of the movie uh this one from like you know this is like uh you know, an example of, uh, you know, Tarantino's racism because it's like, you know, he's uh, inventing a scenario in which like his kind of like cool dude, uh, white guy gets to beat up like the greatest martial artist of all time, which I thought was funny on a number of levels. Cause like one, that whole sequence is like Brad Pitt's character remembering a moment in which he completely right. fucked himself over, <laughs> but he's remembering it. Like, yeah, there's that, that one time I kicked Bruce Lee's ass. Yeah, he's so it's like, like not an entirely it reliable narrative. Narrator. But even if we were to like take that, like his memory of that, uh, you know, invented incident was like, you know, perfect total recall. It's like, what were they really showing about Bruce Lee? Like that he was just sort of a vainglorious actor. I mean, kind of, I mean, he kind of was. He was notorious for being a braggart and, you know, you know, claiming that he invented like the, you know, greatest martial art of all time. And it was just like, and the idea that like it's, you know, totally unthinkable. That like a random stunt man could ever go toe to toe with Bruce Lee. It's like, dude, the guy wasn't a fucking superhero. Okay, he was an actor. Like he didn't have magical powers or whatever. 
You know, I kind of disagree. So Bruce Lee was, you know, a super duper fighter. He had natural, you know, fighting instincts. That's why he was able to create, you know, he was like one of the first guys to, you know, do actually mix the martial arts with each other. Um, a lot of people at that time didn't really think that's what something you should do. Like karate was karate. Taekwondo was taekwondo. He was trying to take new things things from all these other things he was learning that's why a lot of fighters even now respect him and think that like if he was around today he probably still would be a good fighter because he just had that natural instinct but i don't think what they show in that clip like in any way diminishes him because what we actually see is bruce lee throws a flying kick at him knocks booth down Bruce Lee, overconfident, uh, falls for Boo saying to him, come on, uh, do the exact same thing over again. And he was able to adjust and learn and uh, toss his ass into the car, which just shows that Booth at least understands fighting enough to be able to like block the move a second time. Like it doesn't mean that he was going to kick his ass. I tend to, I assume that Bruce Lee probably eventually would have won that fight. Um, but like it, it's not, I don't think like the only person who should be mad about that scene maybe is Bruce Lee's daughter. Everyone else should probably just <laughs> chill out. Like it's not <laughs> like fucking with Bruce's legacy. And you get scenes later of bruce like showing uh sharon yeah. tate um like um uh, uh, like some martial arts and this just really cool and kind of makes bruce look like a cool guy like sure I, he had a big just, ego and that's okay he was a badass it's okay to have a big ego you know like i, I don't know it, it it made it it felt to me like i don't know like like it was respectful of of bruce lee's place in hollywood history like it would be like wrong not to portray him or something like that i don't know uh, uh and also i think it like pretty clearly was like in some ways like fantasy from brad pitt's character like as a joke like a bit of humor in the movie you know <laughs> i think it was a little bit distracting or it took me out of the movie a little bit, even like removed from the racism accusations. It's like, yeah, it's, I took it as a uh, literal rather than it being like uh, embellished by his fantasy because he does wreck the car of the wife of the guy who didn't want him on in the first place. And he gets kicked off and like ruins for the career opportunities. So in the end it is that he's like a dumbass and he doesn't have any restraint. Um, so I don't think it's like a, a fantasy, but it was just sort of like, I can only imagine sitting there writing a script and like, yeah, my character's going to fight Bruce Lee and it's going to be really cool or going to be this or that. I, like, that is, I think only Tarantino, that you have to have like a really big ego. And I thought that's kind of silly. That was one of the few parts yeah, where I was so like, so Tarantino oh. did originally want uh boost character to win, but by cheating, um, which uh, see, that would have been, uh, I think that might've even been but better. See, here's the problem though. Bruce Lee was a cheat. The whole thing about his fighting star was like, I will hit you in the nuts. I will gouge your eye, <laughs> eyes out. Like, you're not going to. That would be, I think I would actually be more insulting if you could cheat to beat, beat Bruce Lee. Because Bruce Lee, like, his whole thing was, I'm trying to kill you. I would do whatever I, it takes. So I don't think he should have gotten, like, surprised by, like, a nut shot or something. He should have been more prepared <laughs> for it. Um, did you also know that um, uh, another one of the sort of like cameos, I guess, in the movie that I really enjoyed was uh, Damian Lewis portraying Steve McQueen? Yeah. I thought that was really cool. But like, did you know that uh, like Steve McQueen, James Coburn, and I think James Garner like studied uh, Jeet Kune Do with Bruce Lee when they were all living in Hollywood. They were like students of his and like they would come over to his house and practice with him and stuff. Oh, I, that should have been – I'm sure Tarantino should have filmed that scene as In well. the four-hour cut of the movie, yeah. I'm sure there was something <laughs> like that. Yeah. <laughs> I was reading too that Steve McQueen officiated at least one of the funerals, I think, after the killings in real life. Wow, I didn't know that. Um, which might have been part of why. I'm trying to look at Wikipedia now, but I can't find it. But yeah. There, there are a lot of references in this movie that I got, and then some that I was just like, I'm sure that's a reference that is just, I'm too young for that. I don't know what that is. <laughs> oh, I'm just going to look it up later. There were like a million things like that. Here was a really good Easter egg that uh, that Matt, uh, Matt Christman pointed out to me when we were watching the movie. Uh, the scene where uh, Cliff drives back from uh, Dalton's house in the Hollywood Hills to his trailer behind the Van Nuys uh, uh, drive-in movie theater, which, by the way, I think may have been my favorite sequence in the movie of just him cruising through Hollywood yeah. and listening to the radio. I was mm -hmm. just like, there's something like just so magical about that. But when he first walks in his trailer – uh, the 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 thing that's on the television at the time is uh Robert Goulet singing. Shit, I forget what song it is, but that 
TV clip, like that TV moment of Goulet singing that song is what was on TV when Elvis famously shot his television because he was so mad that Goulet was <laughs> was singing without passion or feeling or whatever. He got so mad at it that he shot his television. That's and so that's funny. what he was watching when he shot it. <laughs> so one thing we haven't mentioned about this film that I think we would be really remiss uh, in doing so is there so many good boys and good girls in this film, uh, especially uh, Sayura, uh, name, uh, in the film, her name is Brandy. There, uh, There's tons of dogs in the mansion ranch. Uh, Sharon sure. Tate's dog. Is in the, <laughs> it is, this is a, like one of the most magical and wonderful dog movies um, ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's a film, one of the times that I was sad that no one else in the theater laughed was when Brad Pitt took out the dog food and it was like rat flavor and raccoon flavor, <laughs> like food for mean dogs. I thought that was yeah. like really dumb, but really funny. And I was just like laughing a whole bunch. Yeah, no, we all, uh, no, no, Brandy uh, stole the movie for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just such a good, wonderful, beautiful dog. Um, oh, another dog reference in the movie is while Brad Pitt is is killing Tex Watson and those two people in his living room, it cuts to Di- uh, DiCaprio in his pool listening to headphones. And the song he's listening to is a novelty song about Snoopy fighting the Red Baron. <laughs> <laughs> So we we haven't really talked too much about, you know, the main character of this film, Rick Dalton, Leonardo DiCaprio. This is really about his struggle. Uh, This film is really about him um, and his struggle with his acting career. So I just want to ask, like, what you what did you guys think about Leo in this movie? Like, did he really, you know, deliver a performance that like entertained you for all, you know, God, 160 uh, minutes or so this film is? I think he does really well in these sort of like in like comedic roles. I think this and Wolf of Wall Street are my two favorite films of his that I've seen as far as his performance. I thought he was great, especially the range in this. Um, like when he gets upset at himself and then when he's acting as menacing and then the everything at the end. Uh, I liked him more than I usually do. I don't dislike him, but I'm not like, oh, I'm excited. It's Leonardo DiCaprio. I thought it was really good. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree with Shannon. I thought this was like for both him and Pitt were like basic, were like career peaks, and it was like that and Wolf of Wall Street, especially. And again, I got to give it up to Matt, who who pointed this out to me as we were leaving the movie theater. He was like, you know, yeah, like DiCaprio is not a bad actor, but like at the same, like you, Shannon, like I never really, I'm like, oh, I got to see the latest DiCaprio, <laughs> anything he's in, I got, I got to check out because like he's an actor that like you can he his performances are like you can always see when he's acting. You know what I mean? And sure. when he plays characters that are phonies, like Rick Dalton and <laughs> Jordan sure. Belfort, it really, really works. Right. And when he's trying, like, a, you know, when he's doing like the Revenant or whatever, maybe not so much. Yeah. This is a uh, this is it's it's like a Mark Wahlberg as uh, Dirk Diggler kind yes, of uh, yeah. situation mm-hmm. where it's like he's perfectly cast as that because like that's Mark Wahlberg or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is a is a great is a huge standout in this movie. And like you guys were saying, yeah, like for him to be able to not to you know be funny and sort of engaging as a character, have so much range, and then also do all all that like TV villain shit in the movie. It's pretty impressive. It's pretty good. And you know, I, I'm more impressed by this than like his, by the way, I think the Revenant was cheating. That was cheating to win Oscars to like, to actually do all that shit, like get really cold or whatever. That's actually not, that's actually not acting. That's like that's doing being cold and tired. That's actually being cold is what it is. Yeah. So, that's what uh, Lawrence Olivier said to Dustin Hoffman on the Mar- on marathon man. When like in the famous dental torture sequence was, where Hoffman, you know, apparently stayed up for 72 hours straight so he could God. look and, you know, be like properly haggard. And Olivier said to him, have you ever tried acting, my boy? <laughs> you know, they actually, there is a reference to that in the film when the little girl is telling uh, Le- uh, Rick Dalton about her method acting. And he's just <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. kind of like, what the fuck are you talking about? He doesn't really <laughs> get it because he's the, like, he's this old school um, actor. Um, I, I, 
I just want to say, like, I really w- like that sequence of him shooting the TV show. Like, I like how that was great. Yeah, I like how nice everyone is to him, but he's so mean to himself. He's so hard on himself constantly. Right. Um, like even the director, like, um, the director is really in love with him. Like, I, I, I didn't cast you to be, you know, uh, James, whatever, yeah. the cowboy. I can't, I, you're better than that. You're a real actor. I want you, uh, to act. I believe in you. And like, he's, He's just like th- t- threatening to blow his own brains out because he messed and, up and, a line. <laughs> like he's so it, it hard. Gets to the, it's so fucking funny. It's so funny too. Like it get, this movie is like it's like a wish fulfillment movie in, in a way that's like very funny. When it when he <laughs> does that scene and then the little girl is like, "That's the greatest acting I've ever <laughs> seen." It's so fucking funny. <laughs> and I also really love um, in in the scene with Dalton and uh, his his co star, the little girl who's like you know the the, the little girl who's really into acting uh and and he's telling her about the book he's reading and as he's describing the (laughs) plot he just gets more and more choked up because he realizes he's talking about himself as like you know well in his 20s you know he could break any bronco and he he was the best and i guess now he's starting to realize that he's not the best anymore and there's no real use for him (laughs) he just starts crying like (laughs) but i think it was a a really great portrayal of that creative self-loathing and that yeah. kind of gave a great like vulnerability and emotional grounding to the movie um, versus just like the slapstick and just sort of him being pitiful is consistently very funny. Um, yeah. And like, you know, it's a movie, uh, you know, again, about movies and about actors and like it, it has a very funny way of portraying their like, you know, essential um, yeah, self-loathing and self-doubt. And like nothing, <laughs> nothing's ever good enough or whatever. They're like they're always feel like they're past it. But another interesting thing about the movie is that like, it's not I guess it's like kind of a satire of Hollywood but not really cuz it portrays these kind of over the top Hollywood types like the Al Pacino producer character or the director on the TV on Lancer who's like I want a costume that's like Che Guevara <laughs> and Zeitgeist you know and like they're all very funny and kind of like these over the top like Hollywood archetypes but at the same time there's like none of like the typical Hollywood characters are portrayed in like a mean way. Like they're all pretty, <laughs> like, as you said, like they really like Rick and they're like all kind of pretty nice professional people. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, in some ways, like it's a love letter to film because uh, in like the way that the story structure works, like this is a movie that like, it's not a cynical movie. Leslie, I was going to say, Leslie. Yeah. I think you tweeted this out that once upon a time in Hollywood is like hope punk. It's a hope punk movie. <laughs> oh God. I think I have hope punk muted. <laughs> I don't have to hear about it and I'm hearing about it on a podcast <laughs> but, but it is true it is that you know kind of aggressive you know optimism it's just not like cheesy like the original description of Hope Punk is it's like it had this this film has ups and downs and it doesn't deny or uh the horror that exists in the world there's still like some ambiguous elements to it like Will you mentioned like the stuff on the radio that we um hear about we, at the end of this film like we still hear the name Polanski a lot yeah. um, which is not you know which people in the real world know is not necessarily uh something that's com- 1000% positive you know because he is a rapist um but yeah like but it does at least for Rick Dalton it at least works out for Rick and Cliff we have this you know kind of good feeling that they're you know they're still going to be able to hang out they're still going to be able to make movies they're still going to be um best of but um, Brent, the, the dog lives. As, as my wife was so worried that something was going to happen to the dog, that they would at least, you know, sacrifice the dog. But no, none of the good people in this film um, got killed. Well, like a uh, slightly, like like uh, one interesting thing he does in the movie that like complicates that just slightly is the implication that Cliff Booth probably maybe killed yeah, his wife and got away with yeah. it and he like he like they show that brief thing where they're on the boat together and he she's just yelling at him and you just see how tired he is and he's like pointing a, a spear gun right at her and then it cuts before he shows you anything that like may or may not have happened but like that whole thing where like yeah 
Cliff probably killed his wife, which makes like <laughs> what a, what a cool like nice guy he is. Like the fact that you like he kind of steals the movie and you really like him makes it a little bit more difficult. But also the insane explosion of violence at the end of the movie that he pulls off is also sort of like. It doesn't come from nowhere, you know, like right. like the, the violence that is like, you know, like like a like a normal regular person on couldn't do that, let alone on a head full of acid, and that it just like all explodes and comes out of them. Like you're just sort of like, mm, like you know, where does that come from, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I do want to point a fact. You know, people are saying that you cannot actually smoke. LSD, and I want to say to them, you're a bunch of fucking nerds. <laughs> if you buy random drugs from someone, you can, just you because can. they say it's acid doesn't mean it's acid. They might dip, we don't know what they dipped it in. It could have been anything, okay? Well, famously, so, angel dust is what you dip, uh, you, like, you know, a wet cigarette, you know, like the embalming fluid. That's, yeah, yeah, so we, we don't know. It was something that fucked him up, okay? That's all he... <laughs> so, you know, Tarantino, this huge, you know, film director, well made so many great films like i and i really feel like he kind of saves summer film like i don't think of him as like a summer blockbuster filmmaker but this film is by far by far the best experience you will have in theaters this summer like i don't think there's anything that even compares to it yeah no like i like i said in the beginning i saw this in the theater twice this was hands down the most entertaining like not mo- not movie but like movie theater like the whole right kit and caboodle the whole like you know the whole experience of being in the movies watching a movie with other people this is far and away the most entertaining movie i've seen like yeah forget summer but probably in years yeah this is like a theater movie you know much more more than even like the stupid fucking avengers movies or whatever which can eat which everyone sort of thinks of as these big event movies that must be experienced in a theater like i i actually do think this is you know the uh, uh you know, much more like those are easy as easily enter, uh, uh, you know enjoyed on a television set, uh, uh, and I think that you know people would be remiss to not to you know to miss this one in a theater. And I think I'm gonna still try to make it out to see it in uh, 35 millimeter uh, as well. I wish I had that opportunity to see it on 35. <laughs> um, I liked it a lot and a lot more than I thought I would. It felt a lot like a Shane Black movie or a Coen Brothers movie. Versus what I guess I had been expecting from Tarantino yeah, from like were, Bastards, yeah. Django, and Hateful Eight. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, it was very Cohen esque. I felt like a, the, like if the Cohen <laughs> brothers were doing a, a Manson movie, it could have been this one as well. So, where do you rank this among all of Tarantino's films? Uh, huh. That's a tough. I mean, I, I was going I, going into the movie. I was expecting to like it. But leaving the theater, I was like, this may be his best movie that he's ever done. Like, I would put it top three for sure with, you know, this is just my personal opinion. Uh, Inglorious Bastards and Jackie Brown would be the other two, I think, that are his strongest. Yeah, I mean, I actually do think it's up there and it does feel like a, like, more mature work uh, of Tarantino's kind of uh uh and yeah I don't know like uh, uh I'm a big Inglorious Bastards fan too um and you know uh, uh I I wasn't even like a huge I'm not even like the biggest uh Kill Bill guy I don't uh, like Kill yeah, Bill I, I, would, I think yeah, I'm yeah, in I the would, minority I was a big like weeb part two part two but I don't like the first one either I never know. saw part two because I was a big weeb as a teenager I was like it's Tarantino just trying to do that stuff and he's not that good at it. <laughs> <laughs> to me, I, from, I from loving agree. him, like I love Reservoir Dogs, especially, and I was like, Kill Bill's fine. I didn't see part two for many years for that very reason. And I finally I did watch it. part two and it is better than one. Yeah. Um, but the, the I still am not like the biggest Kill Bill fan. I agree. I agree. We have we have we have a quorum. This is yes. Uh, this oh, right. it's <laughs> motion passed. Who knew? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's hard for me to rank this. I feel like I have to kind of go back because I'm very late adopter uh, to you know Tarantino as you know super great because I, I you know I really like Pulp Fiction when I was a kid. I like always liked Reservoir Dogs a little bit better, and then I I didn't really like Jackie Brown the first time I watched it, but I just recently rewatched some of it, and it's a fucking fantastic movie. Like just seeing uh-huh. Samuel the the performances that Quentin Tarantino gets out of Samuel Jackson compared to the dog shit that he does <laughs> in the Marvel movies, that alone makes Quentin Tarantino one of 
America's greatest uh, directors of all time. No, because, yeah, like, like Leslie, I was talking about this the other day with, with with Sam Jackson, where it's just like you can forget what a good actor he is because, like, he yeah. I, I think he just like he likes working and he just says yes <laughs> to like to everything, you know. Um, so like you know he he stays working, which I which I respect a lot. But then you see him in you know a Tarantino movie or like certain other films, and like. The, yeah, the performance, every single performance he does in a Tarantino movie, like you really forget what a fucking fantastic actor he really is. Yeah, so it, it's kind of hard for me, you know, to place it. I don't think I like it better than Inglourious Bastards. Probably like it a little bit more than Hateful Eight just because, but I feel like it's almost a cheat, right? Because Inglourious, because Hateful Eight has that, you know, kind of up and down ending where like the heroes are very flawed and they're probably going to bleed to death. While in, you know, this film, the heroes are actually, you know, pretty good guys aside from maybe killing his wife um and they yeah. both live and you know i kind of i i don't think cliff kills his wife i do think it was an accident i feel like the boat rocks look it happens I think, he's I think he's so, talking to that girl uh named pussy about he's like the law hasn't gotten me yet you're yeah, not gonna be yeah, reason yeah. And it's like ah you killed your wife <laughs> but you know i i i just feel like you know it's almost like like he cheated, like he, like the dopamine hits that you get during the last <laughs> sweet sequence. Like when I watched it the second time, I was just giggling as soon as like that is started where like he, uh, and giggled throughout the ending. And like, I'm sure the other people, uh, uh, there were like, what the fuck? Why is he laughing? But like, <laughs> it's just such a joy to see those, um, dirty fucking racist hippies. <laughs> Get their heads bashed in, and like everyone's okay. And you know, the and and at the, the the very very last scene of the movie, where JC Bring comes down the driveway and is like, "Oh my God, what happened? Is everyone okay? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that, that, oh God, that's terrible. What happened?" And then like, and then Sharon Tate gets on like the you know like the the, the driveway uh, buzzer, or uh, and she's like, "Oh, is that Rick Dalton?" Oh yeah, just like so come funny. up and like and you know just like you. and like DiCaprio like just like him walking up that driveway and like you know the camera sort of like drifts above them and like just it's just so dreamy and then they walk into the house together and you realize like no like like Rick's career is gonna take off and like you know he's hugging Sharon, Sharon Tate lives and like the, the none of the bad things happen American culture redeemed uh, I was floating away it's in heaven. <laughs> I, um... <laughs> I am a pretty hardcore Reservoir Dogs fan. I, when I was a teenager, I loved Tarantino. I have four different copies of it, like four different versions. Um, I think the relationship between Rick and Cliff kind of reminds me of uh, Mr. Orange and Mr. White. And that kind of weird... So something real fast I wanted to ask y'all about. What did they say in the movie that they're um, more than brothers, but less than wives? Yeah. Like, do you th like I felt like that there was like at least a homoromantic implication there. And I think a lot of other people didn't. Um, so I just wanted to ask about that real fast. Because I, I like the sorts of relationships in these movies. Um, uh, Shannon, anytime uh, guys are being dudes at that at, at the level of, of dubiousness <laughs> that we've portrayed yeah, in that movie, sure. like there, yeah, there is definitely a, a homoerotic aspect going on, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, never consummated, but maybe thought about it. We don't know. <laughs> yeah. like, you know, the camera kind of floats away after they've been drinking all night or whatever. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I like I liked Inglorious Bastards. I don't think I rank it as high as y'all do. I really liked Hateful Eight and Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction, and this is probably up there. Especially, it's a, it's a different kind of Tarantino movie, and I uh, appreciated that. It's very weird. I would like to see it again without being stressed out the whole time, thinking I'm going to see get a, seeing a pregnant uh, pregnant woman get stabbed. I think that that kind of changed how I watched it. And if I knew that wasn't going to happen, I'd be a little more chill. Like I um, I'm like I just I j can't say enough. If you haven't seen the movie, please go see it. It's a wonderful film. Like, it's going to make you feel better about almost everything. We live, as Will often says on the show, in a fucking hell world. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, art, culture, film can just make you escape it for a couple of hours. And that's what this uh, film uh, did definitely uh, for me. And, you know, and back to my point about his sort of like his use of alternative history as like pointing a way to like, you know, a better reality for us all. Like, again, I just have to stress, like, not only will the movie make you feel good, but I think it really is um, something powerful and, and joyful about like the power of art to shape reality. And that like, you know, we can create for ourselves through 
you know, cinema or art or any creative endeavor, like not just a better like current reality or better future, but even a better past, you know? Well, I think that's a struggle session for the day, folks. Will, thank you so much for joining us. A pleasure. Have a good one. Peace. Cheers. Thank you.